Howdy, y'all, and welcome back to our course, Databases Demystified, sponsored by Fivetran. I'm your host, Michael Kaminsky. This is the first part in a two-part series. And today, we are going to be talking about transactions. I'll go ahead and warn you that this can be a fairly involved topic. We're going to do our best to explain all of these concepts in a way that's accessible, but we're definitely going to be diving deeper into how databases actually work under the hood. We're going to be talking and thinking about how and where things can go wrong with databases. This will require us to think hard about how computers work at a pretty basic level. We're going to be thinking through the steps of certain programmatic operations and how a database might respond to different ways that things can go wrong. So to motivate this idea, let's imagine that we're building a software system at a bank and we are programming the ability to make an account transfer. There are three steps to this process. First, we're going to subtract from the checking account then we're going to add to the transfers table, describing the transfer. And finally, we're going to add to the savings account. If we take $100 from the checking account, and then we can move it to the savings account. So now we're going to imagine what happens if something goes wrong. When we try to run this operation, we complete step one, subtracting $100. Then we complete step two, adding a row to the transfers table. Then the power goes out and our whole system goes down. The question you should be asking yourself is, what happened to that $100? Did we just subtract $100 from the checking account and lose it? Is it gone forever because we never added it back to the savings account? This seems really bad, and it is. And these types of issues are a lot more common than you might think. We need a way for our databases to be robust to these types of failures. So that brings us to transactions. Transactions are going to help make sure that we don't end up in this bad state where we've misplaced some of our clients' money. So what is a transaction? Transactions allow us to execute certain commands altogether. It's going to tell us what has or hasn't been saved permanently, and it's useful in all databases, not just ones optimized specifically for transactional workloads. However, as we'll learn in the next episode, databases that are optimized for transactional workloads are going to have more fine-tuned control over how these transactions work, and it's going to have the ability to process a lot of them very quickly. Before we get further into this lesson, it's important to understand the idea of database constraints. These are really important, and they're especially important as we talk about where transactions can be most useful. Database constraints are things that programmers use to tell databases what types of data are valid or not. You might have a column that is declared to be unique that may only have unique values in it. Maybe it's a user email field in our web application, so each user must have a different, distinct email address. You might have a constraint that a column can't be null, that it can't have any missing values in it. Or you might specify that a column is an integer and can't have any text values in it. There are lots of these different types of constraints that one might want to enforce at the database level. What's important to know is that any operation that violates a database constraint or would violate a database constraint will result in an error. The database will simply refuse to perform that operation. The database will prevent you from inserting a null value into a non-null column. It will prevent you from adding a duplicate value into a unique column. The database actually asserts these controls at a fairly low level. One more note on terminology. When we're talking about transactions, we use three very important commands, begin, commit, and rollback. Begin will start a transaction. Commit will complete a transaction and save those changes. And rollback will abort a transaction that has begun, and it will roll back to the previous state. As we go through the following examples, we'll be using this terminology, and you'll often see these words referenced if you do any reading about transactions on the internet. So database practitioners very frequently refer to transactions as being ACID. That's an acronym for atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. We're going to talk about what each of these terms means because they're really important for understanding what a transaction is and how it works. When we say that a transaction has atomicity, what we mean is that the transactions happen completely or not at all. There is no in-between. Transactions don't half complete. Either a transaction completes all the way or it fails all the way. Every command between begin and commit must complete successfully. Otherwise, we're going to revert all of the changes that were attempted. So here's an example operation. On the left side, we have the starting state. And on the right side, we have the state after the transaction. We're going to move $100 from the checking account to the savings account. Since the transaction commits successfully, we can see the changes reflected in our account on the right-hand side. When we repeat the same process, but we encounter an error, for any reason at all, we can see that after we roll back, 
the values in our accounts on the right hand side are back to what they were before we started the transaction. So no changes were made. The next concept, the C in ACID, is consistency. This means that databases must maintain a valid state. By the end of the transaction, the database must obey all of the constraints that are on the database. The database may never go from a valid state to an invalid state via transaction. What that means is that all of the constraints are going to be checked by the end of the transaction to make sure that we did not, in fact, violate one of these constraints. Otherwise, our transaction will get rolled back. Transactions maintain consistency, which allows us to more easily reason about our database and be confident that we don't end up in an invalid state. Isolation. This is a really important concept that has a lot of layers to it. We're going to dive deeper into isolation in our next lesson, Transactions Part 2. So we're only going to give a high-level example for now. If you want to go deeper into this, definitely tune into the next episode. So the idea behind isolation is that transactions shouldn't interfere with each other. We'll give an example of how this goes wrong if we don't have good isolation in our database. Let's imagine that we have two transactions that the database is running simultaneously. We want to make sure that they don't interact in a way that causes problems in our data. We can imagine that we have transaction one, which is a really long running and complicated transaction. It starts with subtracting $100 from the checking account balance. Then, while transaction is still running, we start transaction two, and we subtract another $100 from the checking account balance. So we subtracted 100, then another 100, now our balance is at 300. But what happens if our second transaction commits, but after that, our first transaction rolls back? We're going to end up in a bad state, where the application thinks that the second transaction was performed, but the database ends up in a state as if it wasn't. This is really bad. We want our transactions to be isolated so that this problem doesn't happen, so that, so that they run independently. In Transactions Part 2, we'll dive deeply into the different ways that isolation can be a problem and how different databases deal with it. The last important concept, the D in ACID, is durability. This is the thing that is most obvious for a database. This is the part where we save the data that we have. Once a transaction completes, it should be saved to disk, and then we can treat it as permanent. Before the transaction completes, before that commit happens, the changes are not saved to disk. They're not permanent. But then, as soon as we get to commit, that's when we write it to disk and the changes are stored, at least until the database makes other changes in the future. So that's the last step in the transaction, saving it, writing it down, so that the application or user can rely on being able to access that data in the future. So let's go back to our motivating example with the bank account transfer. If we wrap our transfer process in a transaction, we will know exactly what happens when the power goes out. The transaction doesn't commit, and so the changes were never saved, and we can be sure that we didn't ac accidentally misplace some of our client's money. Once the system is back up and running, the system or the user can retry the transaction without any issue. By grouping these important steps together, we make sure we don't lose important data, and we can make sure that all of the steps happen together or don't happen at all. That's it for today. Hopefully, this was a helpful overview of transactions and the key concepts of ACID. In the next lesson, we're going to dive even deeper into transactions. We're going to talk a lot more about isolation levels and how databases actually achieve isolation using something called locks. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. We'll see you in the next lesson.